Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, where we talk with martial arts practitioners about their histories and the influence that their practice of martial arts has on their lives. You are listening to the free version of this podcast, which is abbreviated. Help support this program by considering to subscribe to us on Patreon, where you will get four full-length podcasts each month, one week before the YouTube release date. The cost is that of about one coffee shop coffee per month. Go to www.patreon.com slash malmag to subscribe. That is www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G. If you would like to purchase single full-length episodes of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, visit our Gumroad page at malmag.gumroad.com. And that is M-A-L-M-A-G dot G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com. This week, I get on Zoom and I speak with Ottawa's William Hurst. He talks about his martial arts history, studying various Chinese martial arts, and becoming a student of the legendary Dan Inosanto, and much more. Sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast. And this week, I'm on Zoom and I'm going up to Canada again, and I'm talking with uh, an old friend that I've been trying to get on the show for a while because he's a very, very interesting gentleman and I think has got a very great story that I think a lot of people will relate to and find interesting. He's got a lot of experience in martial arts and I think this will be great. This is William Hurst, but I call him Bill. How you doing, Bill? <laughs> I'm doing great, Tim. Honor and privilege uh, and a pleasure to be invited to talk. Uh, with you and talk about uh, martial arts and life and everything that goes with that. That's awesome. Well, first things first, we are uh, September. How is uh, the fall in Canada treating you? Well, we still get a spattering of, of uh, summer. Uh, the odd tree is just starting to turn. Our evenings are cool. Like the fall, I always say in Canada, we get four seasons, not two. Right, we get uh, four seasons, so we're into fall. So hopefully, we get eight to twelve weeks of you know, balmy days that can go up into uh, the twenties, which would be seventies, right? Um, and nice cool nights. So it's great for if you don't have air conditioning. It's great when you're doing uh, stuff. Uh, in the summer, it can get here. It can be really muggy. So we're we're just entering the fall. You're getting into that, what I would call a Goldilocks zone, where it's just right. <laughs> it, it is just right. You got that right, Tim. I mean, it, it is, you know, August is just drippy, muggy, and it's a oh. different sort of humidity than what I've experienced and my son Nick in L.A. It's a little bit different. It really weighs on you here because it's humid. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's really humid. It doesn't matter what you do. You, you get heat warnings, right? Right. Do you get heat warnings in L.A.? Uh, we do occasionally, uh, usually coinciding with uh, some sort of air quality issue, like if there's a fire or something or there is a uh, just smog. I mean, these, when I first remember coming back here in the 1980s after high school, see, I, I was born out here, but I grew up in the Midwest in Illinois. So I don't remember the 60s in California and the 70s. When I was kind of originally here, but I do uh, remember the 80s when I came back. And there were still, uh, they were still giving what they called smog warnings on um, stage alerts, like stage one, stage two, this type of thing with the actual air pollution. Uh, they haven't done that for a while. I don't know if that's just a bluff that there's no air pollution because I think anybody <laughs> flying in here knows that's not true if they come in during the daytime. Is that why all the musicians back then, including Canadian musicians, they'd all head to Laurel Canyon? Is that higher up? <laughs> it's, uh, well, I think what it is, is there's probably just a bit more of a, a, a breeze and, you know, and you've got more uh, trees and stuff there. So it probably feels fresher. I, I'm okay. going to guess that. It's a, yeah. That's a real beautiful area, but boy, can it, it can get hot in there too. But, um, you know, down by... The beach is always kind of a good place to go because there's always a breeze there too, so you get fresh yeah. air. Yeah. More expensive yeah. probably than the canyon back in those days. Yeah, well, it, it's certainly expensive, but it's all how we <laughs> want to spend our, our time and energy. For us, you know, it's it's uh, going down to the States, which is a priority for, we, we always need to plan for it. But there's quite a financial exchange rate 
And uh, so we always have to take, yeah, it's like sometimes 30 to 40 cents per dollar. And, oh, and, really? Oh, man, that much. Oh, it's huge. So, you know, back in the 90s. I, mean, I should say that, that little, I, I'm meaning the inflation that much. I always thought, for some reason, I think the last time I paid any attention is when I was much younger. It was about 80 or 70, 75 cents or something like that. Yeah, I remember when it was within 10 cents, but it's usually, it doesn't stop us from traveling to the academy right. or down to seminars that I wish they would come back, but I understand some of the limitations. You know, Kevin Seaman and Jim Bro down just south oh, of yeah. Washington State, Phil Jelena in Montreal, you know, John Maymont used to run some stuff with Guru Dan down in Toronto, Makoto Kappa. You could get around. I could see Guru Dan or Larry Hartzell. Uh oh, it looks like we're breaking up a little bit. It was within driving distance. Uh -huh. Yeah. Could you repeat that about uh, Guru Dan and, and Larry being in, within driving distance? It kind of cut out a little bit. Okay. Uh, back in uh, 1985, Bob Carver. Uh, who a lot of the listeners probably know of. Bob's an amazing practitioner, amazing fellow, uh, human being. And Bob uh, hosted Guru Dan in Canada for the first time. Wow. And uh, John Maimon, after that, from Newfoundland to Toronto, then started hosting Guru Dan. Phil Jelena from Montreal. These are all within driving, three, four hour drive for me. Uh, right. Montreal. Uh, Guru or uh, Phil Jelena, uh, one of the first two full instructors in Canada, him and Bob Carver, uh, they would bring, Bob was bringing Guru Dan twice a year, Tim. Wow. He was bringing Master Chai twice, sometimes more per year himself. And then Eric Paulson, when he came on the scene, and Pa Herman, and the list goes on. And Phil Jelena, who's known a lot for various arts, but certainly Pekin Tertia, right? mm -hmm. very high ranking. He's probably one of the longest standing hosts of Guru Dan in the world. Like he's hosted Guru Dan over 30 years straight. And so two hours, you know, in spring, go to Montreal, go to Kevin Siemens in, in Syracuse, right? Mm -hmm. Washington State and Sifu Fong down there. And Larry Hartzell, uh, Bob Kablowski, my dear friend and training partner from the 70s forward. We were the first to bring Larry Hartzell into Canada for a workshop, for a seminar. And um, I had run into, I met Larry at the Dan Timlin camp mm -hmm. in Michigan. And that's where I also met Rick Fay. I just love Rick Fay. If, he, if he's perhaps even listening, I want him to know that you I know what? His tell him. <laughs> he's here visiting LA right now, which is an anomaly. You know, he hasn't been here since the 1980s. He's actually here right now. I saw him last night. I'll, I'll send you the picture I took with him. Oh, I, will tell him, I will tell him you said hello, and I'll tell him that we chatted about that. Yeah, well, at the Dan Timlin camp, there was, and so this is 86, and uh, my partner, um, I trained, Bob Carver and I trained together. I met the wonderful Makoto Kabayama from Toronto. It, that's a very interesting individual. If you don't, don't know him, I recommend you connect with him. And he's under uh, a number of people, but uh, also through Paul Bunak. And um, uh, there was Nino Bernardo and Wayne Chung. There was Larry Hartzell with JKD. Uh, there was Guru Dan with Filipino Martial Arts. And there was Salem Asli. Right. That, that was our people there. And uh, make a long story short, uh, or maybe not short, uh, I was fascinated because I'd only had a certain amount of exposure to the Filipino martial arts. And I, originally, I wanted I was going to go to Aspen Academy, and some of your listeners will know that's when. Uh, yeah, John Maidmont would have gone to that as early as Cass Magda. That's I think where Cass Magda came in the picture. Right. My very first JKD Kali instructor was a student at those camps. Who, who was that? His name was Lauren Bookbinder. Or is I shouldn't say was. He's he's still around. He would have been a uh, teenager 
at that time, probably like 15, wow. 16, 17 years old. So uh, if anybody's there, he may have stood out as one of the few teenagers that was there. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dave Hatch was there as well. Oh. And Dave Hatch, I'm positive he was definitely a serious practitioner, but I, last time we even talked about this, I think he said he was on the camera. <clears throat> really? So, yeah, because it, uh, he mentioned I was one of the rare ones that knew Silim Dow back, wow. back then. And, uh, but Larry, it, it just, you know, we were playing around with focus mitt, say, Tim, and trying yeah. to play with the ranges and but I had not met anybody, and Guru Dan did some of it, but when I went to the Dan Timlin camp, he was doing a lot of focus mitt, uh, entering to trapping, to hitting, and not so much down to the ground, okay? Not going into to that area at that camp. And uh, it just blew me away. I was just so excited about, wow, look at the way he's holding the pads. Look, neutral position, look. Yeah. I started talking with him, and, and I said, would you – be willing to come up maybe it's affordable maybe it's not and larry's just yeah i'll, I'll come up and then when we worked it out financially we kind of geez uh, we don't know if we can afford this and if you know larry anyways back then he said we'll make it work bill you get me up there and we'll see yeah. and we gave him all the money that we collected but he stayed at bob's house and so we hung out and i stayed there too so we got a lot of private time the day before and uh and then did the seminar and then we brought him up again and and they were without going on a tangent it, it kind of he went off with others and not we went off on our ways okay not my place to talk much beyond that and right. I tell you to this day that some of the seeds from the Jun Fan Gung Fu base and the JKD conceptual open mind ranges of combat all came from Larry. I saw him several times after that. Right. And, uh, sometimes I, I do something. He said, you remember that? <laughs> I said, and now I would say, no, I have a really good memory. Not like Eric Paulson. Right. <laughs> Eric Paulson, uh, his instant recall photographic memory, whatever he's got there. But yeah, uh, yeah. That's Larry just, was a joy. Yeah, it's a and, serious gift that guy's got. Yeah, and the, and the trap going into reference point into the various grappling, Larry was really big on that. And to be honest with you, I've mentioned this before, we did far less on the ground. They were like kind of finishing stuff. It was mostly right. entering, boxing, trapping, trapping to stand up, grappling, right. fin finishing on the ground. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that that's it. You're, you're touching on a, it's so interesting the different things you're kind of talking about here because several of them have been either on my mind for a little while or uh, something that's kind of occurred recently. Like anything Larry Hartzell, Larry's, I think about him every day because I was one of his last semi-private students. So for the last, you know, two and a half uh -huh. years of life, I spent a lot of time with him. And uh, so I don't think there's a day that goes by that I'm not thinking about him anyway. But, you know, I, I've been considering doing a project on the history of grappling in JKD. Be it a book. Uh, I've had some people that would mentor me to write a book and others are go, that have written a book saying, hell no, don't do that. There's no money in that. I'm not really worried about the money, but they said, you know, Amazon's kind of killed all that. And they said it's better to make it as a like a film or something. So. You know, I've got that ability too, so we'll we'll see how it plays out. Maybe a, a bit of both, but one of the things I think about with that early grappling in JKD, at least as far as the Heart Soul era, is you're looking at something he was developing for the need of what he was doing at the time, which was security, law enforcement type stuff. Yeah, they right on. So, yeah. yeah, that's why I think you see more things that don't involve a lot of um i don't want to say futzing on the ground because i don't mean it in a in a bad way because you know the jujitsu and and the catch rush shows the people that are they're doing a lot on the ground are highly skilled and it's stuff that you know i really want to dabble into more myself but I, I think it was not uh playing around while on the ground wasn't something larry was necessarily looking to do because of what he was developing it for so it was more 
stuff that was standing up. And then, like you said, if it hit the ground, it's a finish. Yeah, right on. That, that's that's thanks for sharing that because you know a lot of his book, his books were super as well. You know, and oh, yeah. uh, I mentioned Rick Fay earlier because at the Dan Timlin, I'm going back to that. Um, uh, I was fascinated with some of the because I knew you can only do so much at a seminar, right? And, right. Like, as Guru has many times said, you're teaching to preschool or all the way up to emeritus postdoc. Right, exactly. Yeah. What can you what can you present? But there was little things, you know, like just trying to understand, you know, Amaran, a basidario, and some brada and numerado and kunsi and just some of the ways that we train the various areas. And one simple little thing really fat besides the focus that fascinated me was these lock flows, you know, the, the concept of flowing. And, and of course, in Larry's book, as you know, there's a really cool, he goes through all nice little lock flows. So Larry was really into taking those as a separate thing. And I, I, I wasn't getting it, Tim, I, like, because I, I was getting anal and I wanted to learn it. And <laughs> Rick Fay and Greg Nelson were there. And, and they may not, even, I think Rick may remember me, Greg probably not, but they were there. And Larry and the two of them, they were, we were all in beds and stuff like that. And they were in tents. So at the end of the day, they do tie rounds. So I remember standing there and thinking, I like these guys because the, of the conditioning. Because I'm to this day, I, conditioning is very, very important to me. Uh, all right. Yeah. Very, very, very important to be part of your whole life as Guru Dan testimony too. So I went to Rick before he went and it was kind of like, I don't want to bother you, uh, but you know, that lock flow, could you go? And he just graciously, what, what a personality, right? He just, yeah, he, and he showed me. So, uh, so I started, I tried to almost bring him up and, um, but his book, uh, that's why I say, if he's there, if you see him, tell him, Bill said he steals a lot of stuff from you. Okay. Uh, on his curriculum. You know, his pen and do you, say that you steal from him, not that Rick steals from you, right? Because if I get that wrong, that could be weird. No, 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 no. He can steal from me all he wants. You know, uh, it, you know, I, I have other things that I train, but, but, um, but no, his pen and Tukum book with Harry. Oh, and yeah, Kyle, yeah. That, yeah that's great. that is an excellent resource for folks. I mean, there's lots of people that are doing some great stuff, but Rick, had permission and did that way back. Right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'll stop talking about Rick so much, but Larry. No, it's, all, yeah. it's all right. It's like I always say when people talk and they say they're sorry, I said, it's your show. You can talk about what you want, <laughs> like, you know, setting it up. But, but let me, uh, let me do ask you, let's kind of go back to your origins. How did you get, when, and, and how did you get involved in martial arts? Okay. So, uh, I'm going to try to time myself on this. That <laughs> I, I'm an I'm an army brat. I'm an army okay. brat. I was raised my first 15 years in closed army camps in Canada. I didn't go in the military myself, although my brothers did. My dad was a World War II vet, and he landed okay. in first wave of Juneau Beach, and and then he became a career military fellow, became a teacher. Within so one to me one of my greatest mentors, the number one is my father, and um, <clears throat> so we lived in closed camps. And in those days, there we used to test our boxing. It was gentlemen's things. I had way more kind of fisty cuffs before I started training martial arts and went into civvy land, just by being in army camps. Uh -huh. There was always uh, there were certain rules. But you always had that sort of relationship. So, I, and what we didn't like was bullies, and, mm. and and what was very important was teamwork and hard work and developing, doing the best you could do. If you had the crappiest job, it wasn't crappy to you if you did the best that you could do. Mm. Right? It's always that was my father's uh, attitude. So. Uh, I always wanted my older brother did a bit of boxing and my eldest brother did a bit of judo and I watched them on the street, sometimes protecting me or somebody else use it. And I helped set up little. And so I was always kind of interested in it. Being a sportsman, I played a lot of sports, went into physical education, did my master's and exercise physiology, stuff like that. But 
martial arts. Really didn't have the money, Tim. But I, in Toronto, when Dad got out of the army, we went to Toronto, basically Malton Airport. And I was really into horses. And so I couldn't find anything. So when I got accepted to university, uh, you know, at that time, I almost went, you know, do you remember a fellow named Wally Slokey? He's one of Canada's premier contact fighters when the jet, Benny Urquidez, oh, okay. yeah, Jones, yeah. Bob Wall, um, uh, Jeff Smith, uh, and Wally right. Wally Slokey was who he fought. He was the Canadian. Okay, he got a karate school. And, and I thought, maybe I'll, I'll check him out. But anyways, my friends phoned me from Thunder Bay, Ontario, way up in the hinterland, way up there, okay? Uh, and they said, Bill, we know you got accepted at Lakehead University for physical and health education. Did you know that there are so many Southeast Chinese exchange students attending Lakehead and they, uh, there's a bunch of what, Sifus, there's a bunch of, a couple of teachers that will teach North Americans because there was still closed door attitude there, okay? Right, yeah, and yeah. So Sifu Chu Fu Lao, I met when I went up there. One of the reasons I went up there was because I knew I could get in and start studying some Kung Fu. And that was the summer of 73, formally. So I had just turned 20, so I was a late bloomer, although my experiences on the street were maybe a bit more than a lot of people. Um, I, the aspect of, of uh, bullies that you would stand up to that was already ingrained in me. Um, so when I went up there, I met Sifu Chu Fu Lao. And this was around, now that I'm, I'm, I'm with, I have been for a while now with Sifu Francis Fong, it's interesting because Sifu Francis Fong came to Canada, if I'm not incorrect, in 1972. And he went to Queen's really? University. Yes, he went to Kingston, which is about an hour and a half, two hour drive from here. And from there he went down to, I think he went to New York. So in 72, 73, there was quite an influx of Chinese. And this concludes the abbreviated version of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast please click the like and subscribe buttons as well as the notification bell. Also consider subscribing to the full-length podcast at www.patreon.com slash malmag or purchasing individual full-length episodes at malmag.gumroad.com. Thank you for listening to this episode with William Hurst. Coming up next week is my first repeat, Kurt Cornwell, Part 2. Check out the Melmag store at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and click on the store tab. There, you will find a full selection of Timmy B's brand sticks for FMA and Kirby Kerbong, as well as Timmy B's and Dos Manos t-shirts. Many more products coming soon. Also click on our courses tab to purchase online courses, right now featuring the course in the Dos Manos stick of FMA. More courses to come. This show is produced by Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine. Visit us at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and enjoy the free version of our online magazine with articles, a recommended schools page, and a worldwide events calendar. Music by Jack Al Relic. Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine and the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast are trademarked and copyrighted by TNT LLC. Music